All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to DTSC's public workshop on orthophthalates and bisphenol A and their alternatives in food packaging. Um, this morning, um, we're happy to have everyone here in person and everyone listening in online uh, to our workshop. This is um, a workshop that follows our October 24th webinar, which outlined our general interest in food packaging with ver a variety of classes of chemicals. Um, and in that October workshop, we kind of laid out our broad approach to looking at food packaging under the Safer Consumer Products Regulations uh, and that category in our Priority Products Work Plan. We're going to be lay rolling out a series of workshops uh, focusing on a variety of different chemical classes in food packaging. And today's we're talking about orthophthalates and bisphenol A, and we have a variety of speakers, and we're going to dig in a little deeper. Um, before we get started on the actual program, I have a little housekeeping to do. Um, my public participation specialist is not here today, so I'm going to see if I can play that role adequately. That may be a challenge. But for those of you in the room, if there is an emergency and the alarms will sound, the light will flash, please exit the building. Don't take the elevators. Go down the stairs where you came in, out the front into the park across the street. If you need to use the restroom, restrooms there in the hallway outside this door. Um, for those also here in the room, uh, we're going to have, after each presentation, a brief time for clarifying questions, um, and then we'll have a question uh, and comment period available, and if you want to make a comment, you can fill out one of the cards, uh, and someone will pick that up and we'll, we'll um, address those in the order that they come in. I think, given the size of the crowd and the time allotted, we're going to have plenty of time to have some discussion, so I'll look forward to that. And we really want to encourage you to participate. These workshops are really part of an ongoing effort that we have, which is not to be just telling people everything, but also to be listening from all the different stakeholders. So this, this dialogue is part of the approach that we use in going from our priority products work plan to actually making decisions about potential priority products that we would list in regulation. But that process is a long process, and it's really important that we get input at every step along the way. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to start off with some brief um, overview on our regulatory process. But before we do that, I want to see that I'm making sure that people have the information they need. So if you're listening online, you can see that there is a, an address where you can send questions in. We encourage you to do that. Also, if you want to look at any of the documents um, from the workshop, and if you want to formally comment on our documents, you can use our CalSafer web portal, and that address is on the screen right now. You can link to that or find it on our web page. And again, we have all of our documents on our web page for this workshop, the subsequent workshops, and as we uh, move through the process, um, you'll be able to find all that information. So briefly, um, as most of you know by now, um, our safer consumer products regulations are, can be divided into four basic parts. The first part of the regulations identifies what we call candidate chemicals. These are chemicals that we're concerned about because of their hazard traits or their potential exposure to people or the environment. That list, which you can find on our CalSafer web portal, contains several thousand chemicals and a number of classes of chemicals which themselves have a lot of chemicals in them, things like PFAS and some of the classes we're talking about today. So there's more than one chemical in some of those classes. That chemical list is really a menu of the chemicals that we look at in conjunction with consumer products so that that chemical product combination is what we call a priority product. The second part of our regulations really dictate how the department goes about collecting information and making decisions about what we want to focus on in our regulations. We do that through putting out the Priority Products Work Plan, which identifies the categories of consumer products we're looking at, and it identifies our policy goals as well. We have broad authorities within our statute and regulations to make decisions that we think will be meaningful in protecting people and the environment. So. The work plan and this process really focuses on how we collect that information and make those decisions moving forward. 
So today's workshop, to put it in context, we're at the very beginning of the second step of the process. We're, we've done some basic research you're going to hear about uh, today from our staff in this sector. Uh, we're going to continue to collect information from all the stakeholders, and as we move that process, that will inform us in terms of uh, what products we, we choose as a priority product. Once we choose a priority product, we go through a whole other process of adopting regulations, which also gives uh, folks an opportunity to look at all the information that we're using as a basis for our decision and to give us input um, from their perspective. The third part of the process, once we actually pick a product, which is down the road, um, and we list it in regulations, then manufacturers who sell that product into California then have some options to look at. and. and primarily looking at ways that you can do what we call an alternatives analysis, which is a robust life cycle approach look at that product and its potential alternatives uh, and weighing different options on how that product could be made safer with a focus on making it safer as well as ensuring that uh, those choices don't lead to a regrettable substitute. And finally, uh, once the AA process is complete, the department then evaluates those alternatives analyses, and if necessary, we can implement what we call a regulatory response, which is a broad array of options that, that range from us requiring manufacturers to submit additional information to us, provide information to consumers, perhaps put in some safety measure in their product or process, and ultimately, if necessary, uh, we can restrict the sale or ban the sale of that product in California. So with that, um, moving right along, as I, as I circle s the second step, that's why we're here today. And I want to stress a couple of things. One is that um, we are, uh, this process takes a while, and it's important because it's really uh, important that we get good information. And so um, we're going to be giving you the information we have today. We've posted some questions out there. We're going to hear from um, a, another speaker from industry, um, Dr. David Adenuga. That was close. Um, and, and again, so uh, David's going to provide some perspective on, uh, on um, orthothalates, orthothalates from um, an industry perspective. And we hope to hear from many of you both uh, in future forums. And if you have an interest, you can contact us, and we're happy to talk with you. Um, oops, did I go too far? Yes. I wanted to briefly just. Um, touch on the broad, broad uh, nature of this category of food packaging and uh, what, how we've defined it. And let me grab my glasses. <laughs> Old age has its privileges. Um, so in our 2018-2020 Priority Products Work Plan, we define food packaging as any product that is used to package hot, cold, frozen, or room temperature food or beverage items for sale to restaurants and grocery stores or for retail sale to consumers. And as you can see in that definition, it's a quite a broad definition. And so as we go through looking at these these um, various classes of chemicals, uh, keep in mind that we haven't made any decisions about what we're focusing on. That's part of this process. Not just the class of chemicals, but the types of food packaging for which there are a multitude. So really, we're in the information collection stage right now. And as we move forward, we'll, we'll share our findings. We put those out in the form of what we call a priority products profile um, once we get narrow that scope. And so once again, I just want to stress the importance of hearing from you. When we put questions out, sometimes we don't get a lot of input, but it's important that we get that input so that we can be better informed in our decision making. So, um, The other thing I wanted to just touch on very briefly is that we've heard from a lot of folks and we continue to hear from folks that are concerns about how our program uh, relates to things like FDA's program. And a couple of things. One, we're not allowed to do anything that is, uh, goes against state or federal law, so we can't conflict with state or federal law, and we're not, we have no plans to do that. And also, even in those areas where there may be some related um, overlap or potential uh, interest in similar types of exposures or concerns, we also want to make sure that the decisions we make are good ones based on are we going to be doing something that's meaningful, that will make a difference uh, in terms of limiting exposure to hazardous chemicals to people or the environment. So um, it's complex. We are uh, actively um, coordinating with FDA, uh, and we appreciate their help, and we will continue to do that moving forward, as well as all the other stakeholders. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, 
Dr. Rob Bruscia, or Bruscia. I can't pronounce anyone's name today, right? So um, I've only known him for 10 years. So um, Rob is going to talk a little bit about our, our perspective on orthophthalates and food packaging. And we'll have a little bit of time for um, uh, clarifying questions. And then um, we'll go on to the next speaker after that. So with that, I will look forward to Rob's presentation. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Carl. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Rob Bruch. I'm a research scientist with DTSC. And I'm going to begin today's topics by talking with you about orthothalates and food packaging. What I'm going to do is give you a very brief summary, and it is very brief, of what we know about food packaging. We have done, or about orthothalates and food packaging, we have done a very considerable amount of research over the past year into this area, and we still have a few key questions. And at the end, I'll present our key questions, but I do want to just say that we're, that those aren't the only thing that we're interested in. While we're interested in getting feedback on those key questions, anything that you, any kind of input that you'd like to provide, we're interested in hearing about. Um, for the folks here in person, there are comment cards that are being handed out over by the uh, entrance to the room. Um, if you later at the end of the at the end of the talks, if you want to make a comment, we ask that you fill out one of those cards. And as Carl said, someone will collect them, and then uh, we will call folks in the order in which the cards are received. And someone will bring around a microphone so that you can comment. After each talk, we're going to have a few minutes for clarifying questions, but we would like to limit it only to the clarifying questions on the talk during that period and then open it for the public comments after all the talks are done. So with that, um, as Carl mentioned, we are currently evaluating food packaging under our 2018-2020 priority product work plan. And one of the groups of chemicals that we are looking at is orthothalates. <clears throat> So, in terms of topics, I'm going to start out by describing what we mean by orthothalates. Um, I'm going to give you a brief summary of what we know about the, their current use in food packaging, and then I'm going to summarize our concerns re related to the use of OPs or orthothalates in food packaging. Um, again, we really, we really hope that you take this opportunity to begin engaging us. We are eager to learn about the market for these products, and um, <clears throat> as Carl mentioned, our Written comment periods are up online on CalSafer, and you should be able to go on there and make written comments. That'll be open until December 19th, I believe. And, um, and also, if any of you are interested in meeting with us, there will be some contact information provided on some later slides. Feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to consider meeting with you at any time. There we go. Okay, so what are orthothalates? Well, they're dialkyl or alkyl esters of 1,2-benzene uh, dicarbolic, dicarbolic acid. There's the, the generic structure shown there. All of the various orthothalates basically differ in their respective R groups. Um, there are actually a few dozen of these on our, on our informational candidate chemical list, which is on our CalSAFER website. However, it's really important for everyone to note that Orthothalates are captured as a class on our candidate chemical list, and what that means is that any orthothalate that meets this general description is captured, whether or not it's specifically listed on our informational list. <clears throat> and it's the use of this entire class of chemicals that we're looking at in food packaging. So and what that ultimately means is that if we ever were to look at naming a product orthothalate combination as a priority product, that we could potentially include all of the orthothalates as a class in that listing, whether or not they appear on our informational list. <clears throat> okay. So what do we know about their use in food packaging? Again, we've done a lot of research over the past year, and we know quite a bit. Um, nonetheless, we still have some questions, and where most of our questions center is around the market for these things in California. There have been differing accounts regarding the use of, of orthothalates in food packaging. A few years back, a now-defunct um, industry trade association stated that uh, orthothalates are no longer used at all in any food packaging manu manufactured in the U.S. And in fact, trends in biomonitoring data do show that uh, exposure to orthothalates on a, uh, a decreasing trend. However, there was a recent study I've cited here um, by Carlos et al. that uh, showed that orthothalates are in fact still being used in some food packaging applications. Um, 
Only a few package types were, were evaluated in the study, though, so we really don't know how well it reflects the overall market. And we are also aware that the FDA was petitioned by industry recently to rescind the authorization for certain uses of some types of orthothalates in food packaging. However, after talking with the FDA and doing an analysis of that petition and the regulations that would be impacted, it is our understanding, and we're interested in you correcting us if we're wrong, but it's our understanding that the use of uh, orthothalates as plasticizers in some cases would still be allowed. Basically, they would be grandfathered in and they wouldn't be impacted if the FDA were to, um, were to accept the petition. <clears throat> So in summary, while the use of orthothalates in food packaging seem, does seem to be decreasing, there still seem to be um, a few applications where they're still being used. Okay, and so what types of packaging? Well, again, the paper that I just referenced, what they showed was primarily um, cap gaskets for various types of products are where there were a lot of orthothalates found. Um, Again, though, they didn't analyze all that many individual products, so again, we're unclear how well this really reflects the overall market. Okay, and so why are we concerned with them? Well, diet has been considered a major exposure for orthothalates for quite a while. Um, biomonitoring, although showing trends for decreasing exposure, still shows that there's widespread exposure to these chemicals in the human population. And then, in terms of hazards, the primary hazard that we're, that we're concerned with is developmental and reproductive toxicity. Um, to some extent, carcinogenicity for a couple and mutagenicity, but primarily it's reproductive and developmental toxicity. And these hazard traits have been recognized by a, a large number of authoritative bodies. And in fact, we're the basis for listing many of these on our candidate chemical list in the first place. <clears throat> in fact, concerns over these hazard traits have already prompted a number of regulatory bodies to actually ban their use in some uh, types of children's products and that is the use of some specific phthalates, not all of them. <clears throat> okay, um, a word about alternatives. We do not know a lot about alternatives. This is another area, in addition to the market, that we are interested in finding out about. Um, it's been suggested that some manufacturers are, in fact, switching. Um, again, the paper that I referenced by Carlos et al. in the couple slides earlier um, seems to suggest that uh, this compound here, DEHA, is a common substitute for orthothalates in some products, um, especially in PVC food service wraps and, and gaskets for non-alcoholic beverages. Um, but it is worth noting that that chemical is also on our candidate chemical list. So anyways, that's about all we really know about, the, about uh, substitutes for orthothalates in, uh, or alternatives for orthothalates in food packaging. And that really concludes my summary, and it brings us to our discussion questions. Um, there were a couple of handouts over there. One had the questions all listed on it for orthothalates, and the other one had the questions all listed regarding uh, BPA. So hopefully you picked one of those up, and it'll make it a lot easier to look at because they're spread out over a couple of slides. But <clears throat> basically, again, um, and for those of you participating online, the questions while they're available here in these slides, they're also available on our public background documents that you can access via our website. And really all of our questions revolve again around um, the issues of what food packaging still contains OPs or the phthalates, who is making them, and who is using them to package foods. Most of the data that we have is a couple years old, uh, the most recent, and so that's why we are interested in what's really going on in the industry today. Um, we also, again, don't fully understand the alternatives, and we don't understand whether there are alternative materials being substituted for the PVC-based plastics where the phthalates are used, or if it's more direct chemical substitutes than what they are. <clears throat> in terms of the supply chain, we would really like to understand the supply chain better. We would like to know who manufactures the orthothalates that are being sold to food packaging manufacturers. <clears throat> Excuse me. We would all also like to know more about inter any intermediaries or converters that are involved in the process. From our talks with the FDA, we understand that these are folks that take sort of basic materials that have been manufactured by others, like polyethylene film, for example, and then they assemble it into a final package to meet a specific food packager's um, technical specifications. We don't know who they are, and we don't know really a lot about that process. Um, and then we don't know um, if there are manufacturers of uh, orthothalate-containing food packaging that are actually 
in California, um, or if there are a lot of ones outside of the United States that are supplying this type, these type of packages. And then finally, in terms of the market, um, we would really like to know who in California is purchasing these types, this type of packaging and what they're using it for. Um, and then we would also like to know what, if anyone is out there who makes bottle caps or gaskets that are sold in California that contain orthothalates. And that concludes my presentation. As Carl mentioned, we have a guest speaker, Dr. David Deniga. Is that did I pronounce it correct? All right. Um, <laughs> and he's going to uh, give a few words on industry perspective. But before we do that, I'm sorry, I forgot. Are there any clarifying questions? And folks online, you can submit your questions to the uh, <clears throat> to the Safer Consumer Products um, email address that was given on the second slide in the presentation. Anyone has a question? Just raise your hand, and someone will bring around a microphone. No questions. Okay, with that, turn it off to, over to Dave, Dr. Danuga, and um, thank you very much. Excuse me, sorry. All right. Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Robert. Mm -hmm. You can see the Okay, I can see that. All right, so so my name is uh, David Adenuga. I am a uh, toxicolog PhD toxicologist uh, from the University of Rochester, New York. I'm actually here representing the uh, the Flexible Vinyl Alliance today. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to give everybody an idea of what the Flexible Vinyl Alliance is. It is essentially a coalition of trade groups. Uh, they're concerned with the uh, regulation of uh, orthothalates uh, in, in commerce. Uh, orthothalates, as Robert mentioned, are actually used in a variety of plastic applications. Uh, I think the one that will be most specific to this will be the use of orthothalates in flexible uh, PVC applications as well. <coughs> um, so Robert had put, put up a couple of questions that the DTSC is asking with respect to the use of orthothalates in food contact. And there are two specific questions, uh, I think, on the, on the manufacturing side that I really wanted to address today. Uh, the first one is which orthothalates are used in food packaging and what products are they used in. And I, I think from Robert's presentation, it looks like the DTS has done a pretty good job looking at some of that. Uh, Robert had mentioned uh, some of the other failures that are used in food packaging, but I w wanted to bring a little bit more of some uh, detailed perspective on that uh, in this presentation. Uh, before I, I go into that, I thought I would give you a, a quick uh, background information. Uh, Robert had mentioned that uh, the Flexible Vinyl Alliance had put together a food additive petition, but I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a backstory. So, um, as some of you may be aware, uh, uh, orthothalates have been approved for use in food contact applications in the United States for many, many years. I'd probably say more than 30 years now by the FDA. Um, so in 2016, uh, a, a group of uh, uh, NGO coalitions put together a food additive petition that they submitted to, to the FDA. Uh, the food additive petition was asking the FDA to essentially revoke the clearances for 30 autothalates uh, in, uh, in that, that are currently on the books today. Um, in 2018, the FDA published the study that Robert mentioned. This was a study that actually was looking at uh, food packaging in the United States and what autothalates are used in, in those, uh, uh, those applications. Uh, of the 30 um, all the phthalates that uh, the uh, NGO said, the NGO food additive petition was looking to uh, uh, revoke, uh, the FDA actually found three are still used in food contact in the United States. And those three are DIMP, diacinol phthalate, uh, diacinol phthalate, which is DIDP, and uh, diethyl hexyl phthalate, which is DHP. Uh, the Flexible Violent Alliance uh, essentially also filed a food additive petition in 2018. And that food additive petition essentially said, look, of the 30 orthothalates that NGOs have requested that the, that the FDA revoke clearances for, 26 of them actually no longer have food additive uh, uses at all. In fact, it's, it's most likely because for some of these materials, those orthothalates are actually no longer in commercial production. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, diaso, dioctonol DNOP uh, actually has them in commercial production for at least 25 years, if I'm actually uh, correct on that. Uh, so some of them are no longer in commercial production, and some of them actually uh, are no longer used at all in food contact. And the other thing to point out, the, 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 uh, the fact that they're no longer used in food contact really doesn't have anything to do with their risk at all. It just simply means industry has essentially evolved and moved on to other materials, so that, that's why that is. Now, 
Uh, the, all the, the only uh, materials that are currently used in food contact in the United States are actually three that the FDA identified in 2018. Those are diacinonal phthalate, DIMP, diacidesyl phthalate, DIDP, diethylhexyl phthalate, DHP, and, uh, and there's another one, uh, dicyclohexyl phthalate, DC, DCHP. So those are the four that I'm going to be uh, speaking on a little bit today. Um, in, tw in November of 2018, the FDA essentially filed uh, the FBA's uh, petition, uh, abandonment petition. Uh, in 2019, we heard back from the FDA, I think that was April of last of this year, uh, indicating that they were close to finalizing the decision on the industry of food additive petition. So we anticipate a hear back from the FDA uh, in due course in the next couple of months. So to, to go back to asking the, uh, the two critical questions that I wanted to address today. Um, as, as I mentioned, this is essentially uh, our take on the FDA's uh, food, additive, uh, food additive survey of other phthalates that they published in June of last year. Uh, if you notice, they identified DIMP, DEHP, DIDP, and DCHP as actually they only identified DIMP, DIDP, and DHP as being used in, uh, in food contact. And they're essentially used in really, really narrow applications. So those applications on the, on the federal law essentially is 178-3740, which is essentially the approval for use of, 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 of the phthalate in PVC applications only. It doesn't apply to any other plastics. Uh, for, DID, for DIDP and DHP, the uh, applications of relevance are uh, 177.12.10, which is used as uh, uh, sealants, as Robert mentioned, and also 177.2600, which is uh, for uh, repeated, repeated use as well. Um, those applications, especially for DIMP, DIDP, and DHP, are really for use in conveyor belts, uh, which is used in industrial uh, food packaging, uh, food contact applications. Uh, they're also used in industrial tubing, specifically for non-fatty foods. That, that's the other thing to, to note here. This, uh, this uh, uh, clearances on the FDA are not essentially broad. They're actually very, very narrow. So for example, conveyor belts, you can't use it uh, for fatty foods. For uh, industrial tubing, you also cannot use that for, for, uh, for fatty foods as well. Uh, the other application that Robert mentioned was used uh, for sealing gaskets. This is uh, used for, this applies to DIMP, DIDP, and D DHP, but as, as, as he also mentioned as well, it's not essentially a broad, uh, a broad application. Uh, they're using sealing gaskets specifically for non-fatty foods and also for, for low al alcoholic foods as well. The only other application of note, uh, this was not identified in the FDA paper, but this is specific for DCHP. It actually has only one clearance under the FDA. It's essentially it's used for adhesives, and it's specifically used an adhesive label for the exterior of polypropylene bottles. So as you would notice, even though it's used essentially in what I'd call food contact, the ability of DCHP to actually contact food is actually very, very limited, unless it, it would essentially it will not cross that polypropylene barrier at all. Now, this, uh, this, I think, is really, really important to point out, and that's why I want to spend a few seconds on this slide. Uh, I, I mentioned that the FDA had looked at a uh, food, at, food uh, um, packaging survey for other in 2018. Health Canada actually also did this in 2014, and this is where they identified that other phthalates are not used in. They're not used in food drops at all. Uh, for your gross, for your grocery uh, stuff, like uh, for example, for meat wraps, for cheese wraps, for vegetable wraps, they're also not used at all in films at all. So you will not see them being used to package your foods in a deli or a sandwich shop, for example. So that's really, really important to keep in mind, especially when you when you uh, keep in mind uh, the definition that Carl had given for for food contact for food packaging earlier on. The other thing I also wanted to talk about is there is often this misconception that the issue of orthothalus in food packaging is really just an, a U.S. issue, and the FDA is probably being very negligent in continuing to maintain orthothalate use uh, in food contact. That's actually not true. Orthothalates are actually also approved for use in food contact globally. As I mentioned, I'm only just uh, focusing on DIP and DIDP today just for the sake of time. Uh, as you notice, uh, uh, G GMC Resolution 32 in the Mercosur region in South America does approve the use of DIDP in food contact applications and repeated use. Uh, the, the latest uh, version that was submitted to the WTO last year now includes DIMP as well, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, China as well, the, tw the 2016 food, uh, food packaging bill permits the use of DIMP and DIDP in uh, food contact PVC. 
Uh, South Korea also missed the use of DIMP and DIDP in food contact PVC. Uh, Japan, as you would know, did not have a positives list until early this year. They actually submitted a draft of a positives list for food contact in August of 2019. They have DIMP and DIDP listed in that food, uh, positive list for use of food contact. Uh, Europe as well, uh, DIMP and DIDP are approved for use in uh, uh, for, as plasticizers and single-use PVC and repeated, uh, repeated articles. Uh, and in, the, in Switzerland, which is not part of the EU, they actually permit the use of DIMP and DIDP as plasticizers and food contact applications as well. And these are all very recent. These are not 50, 30, 50, 90-year-old uh, reg regulations. This is fairly recent. Um, Canada is one of the few countries that actually does not have a specific uh, mish, uh, 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 food contact um, uh, positives list for food contact applications, but in fact, they actually conducted a dietary risk assessment for th author phthalates in 2017, and they essentially concluded that DIMP and DIDP, among a few other th author phthalates, uh, are actually safe, uh, are safe as present in, in the diet. <clears throat> the other uh, country I wanted to point out to is also Australia and New Zealand. Uh, very similar to Canada, they also do not have a specific food contact regulation like the, F like, uh, the U.S. has. Um, Australia conducted a dietary risk assessment of orthothalates in food packaging back in 2018. New Zealand did the same thing in 2017. Both countries conclude that for the purpose of use of orthothalates in food packaging, there is actually no concern at all for the public. So that's really important to point out. It's not just a US-centric issue. The rest of the world does agree with the use of these materials in the limited uh, applications that they're used for. The other point I wanted to raise as well as something that Kyle mentioned. <clears throat> Uh, we've been, we were aware, we looked at the priority plan, and we're also aware that DTS is committed that they don't intend to duplicate or conflict with uh, existing regulatory uh, requirements in the United States. That includes the FDA. So I wanted to uh, just kind of point that out. And so just to summarize, these are really the four key points. If you don't take anything else from this presentation, these are the four key points that I would like you to take, to take away. All the thyroid is permitted for use in food contact, not just in the United States, but in other countries around the world. And that includes the, the European Union, Switzerland, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, and as well uh, uh, South American, also Asian countries as well. Uh, the other thing I also want to point out is the use of food contact in the United States is minimal uh, in food packaging. Uh, I, I did mention the, uh, the food packaging survey that uh, the, the USFDA published last year and also uh, the Health Canada published in 2014 as well. Um, those uses are really in narrow food contact applications. You will not see orthothalates used in food wraps or in films as well. And one, the, the last, last but not the least that I wanted to point out is to continue to encourage DTSC. Uh, the the uh, food additive petitions are still pending before the FDA currently, and we, we would encourage you to wait until the FDA comes before the DTSC uh, moves on with uh, any potential regulation on all the pilots and food packaging. All right, any, any questions? Sure, go ahead. Oh, hold on. hold on a second. Sure. We're gonna okay. microphone to you so the folks on listening online can hear. Thank you. My name is Lisette Van Vliet from the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. Thank you. Can you tell us how many countries around the world actually do cumulative risk assessment for common adverse outcomes for the chemicals in their food packaging? Because I worked on food packaging in Europe as an NGO representative, and I can tell you there we thought at the time that I was working there and in touch with my former colleagues, they still think that the rules in the EU are just as negligent about endocrine disruption, which can lead to deathly diseases like breast cancer. And Europe is generally recognized to have the best, most protective chemical rules in the world. So if that is the case, and if the European rules are so abysmal, how is it then that the rest of the world's rules excuse our continued use of these chemicals. Well, I, I mean, to go uh, back to my question, correct. how many countries in the world actually use cumulative risk assessment so that they look at the additive effects of chemicals together as opposed to one by one and actually look at real exposure, not only from food packaging, but also from other sources to decide whether that use in food packaging is protective of public health? 
I, I mean, I, I will point you to the European Food Safety Authority's uh, recent dietary risk evaluation that they conduct. And in fact, they submitted a draft uh, document on that in uh, February of 2019. That actually can, uh, in, took into consideration accumulated risk. So that might be one area you might want to look at. I've looked at that. Okay. Sorry, but if you're up to date with what the NGOs are saying about EFSA draft guidelines, I think you would find that your answer is not sufficient. Any other uh, questions in the audience here? I think we have at least one online. All right, we have a question here from Scott Boyito, I hope I pronounced that right, from the Product Stewardship and Adv Advocacy. Uh, he says, yes, DEHA is a major alternative to OPs in food packaging, the major uses in food film wrap. DEHT, or dye to ethyl hexyl uh, terephthalate, is another major alternative in use in some food packaging applications, including caps and closures. Eastman Chemical is the only domestic manufacturer of DEHP. We sell a vast majority of this into medical applications, but it is possible that some DEHP goes into food packaging applications. We do not have any direct knowledge of those applications since we do not actively market into those applications. The most likely use of DEHP in the market would be for tubing and related products used in dairy products, such as milk collection equipment. So in actuality, he had a comment and not really a clarifying question, but we'll, we'll take note of his comment. So are there any other questions related to the presentation? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Dr. Adenogwa. I think I got that better this time. Um, next on our agenda, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Leonetti. Um, Chris is a uh, environmental scientist in our program, and he's going to be talking to you about our look into bisphenol A and its alternatives in food packaging. Chris. Thanks, Carl. All right. Hello, and welcome again to our public workshop on food packaging products. My name is Chris Leonetti, and I'm an environmental scientist with the Safer Consumer Products Program. We're now going to switch gears and talk about a different group of chemicals, bisphenol A and its alternatives in food packaging products. ETSC is interested in the use of bisphenol A, other bisphenol analogs, as well as other non-bisphenol chemical alternatives that are used in food packaging. Specifically, DTSC is interested in the application of these chemicals in food and beverage can liners, as well as in bottle caps, lids, and gaskets. Today's short introduction to this topic will cover the following discussion points. After this public workshop, there will be a public comment period open for 30 days from the state. All right. So, bisphenol A, or BPA, is widely used in the manufacturing of epoxy-based resins that coat the interior of aluminum and steel food and beverage cans, as well as other food packaging liners, such as jar lids, bottle caps, and gaskets. Collectively, the functional use of liners is to protect the metal packaging surfaces from corrosion, to preserve food, to act as an inert barriers to a wide variety of food types, and to be easy to use in the can and lid production manufacturing process. DTSC is interested in the entire range of food packaging liner types and their specific applications, and is taking a functional use approach initially in order to be comprehensive in our evaluation of this product category. Currently, we have limited knowledge of where BPA is still being used in food packaging liner applications. Due to growing public awareness and concern over the potential health impacts of BPA over the years, Many manufacturers have voluntarily removed BPA from food packaging applications. These products are advertised as such and bear labels indicating to consumers that these items are BPA free. However, we have limited knowledge of what alternatives have been used to replace BPA in many of these applications. Additionally, as I'll talk about in a few slides, many of the BPA alternatives exhibit similar hazard trait profiles and public health concerns as BPA representing a case of regrettable substitutions. We are hoping that our engagement with stakeholders will help to increase industry transparency on this topic, 
as well as help answer some important questions such as what chemicals are used in BPA-free food packaging products, as well as what are the different alternatives used in these different food packaging product applications. The primary source of BPA exposure in humans is dietary. BPA has been widely detected in environmental and biological media, indicating near ubiquitous human exposure. BPA and other chemicals used to produce liners can migrate out of food packaging products and into food items, thus leading to dietary exposure in humans. BPA migration out of candid lid liners into food and beverage media is influenced by many variables, such as food acidity, storage time, temperature, or alcohol and lipid content. Most Californians frequently consume canned food and beverage items that come in contact with can or lid liners for long periods of time. Additionally, canned food consumption tends to be higher for low-income residents who may live in food deserts and have limited access to fresh, unpackaged foods, leading to higher rates of BPA exposure. Thus, dietary exposures to BPA and its alternatives are widespread via contaminated food items and represent an issue of, of environmental justice. The hazard traits and risk assessment profile BPA have been characterized by many regulatory bodies, such as US FDA, OEHA, and the European Food Safety Authority. This slide shows the hazard traits defined for BPA by the authoritative lists recognized per SCP's regulations. As you can see, the primary concerns for BPA are related to developmental, endocrine, and reproductive toxicity. Additionally, the effects of BPA have been thoroughly documented in the scientific literature, with significant work across a full range of scientific analyses, including animal studies, epidemiological study populations, mechanistic in vitro work, and environmental monitoring studies. In short, BPA has been shown to be an endocrine disrupting compound that is biologically active at very low concentrations and exhibits nonlinear dose response behavior. BPA and many of the other bisphenol analogs have been shown to bind various hormone receptors such as estrogen, thyroid, and androgen and elicit um, subsequent endocrine disruption. Additionally, significant human epidemiological data suggest associations between BPA exposure and metabolic syndrome, infertility, and neurodevelopmental effects. These adverse impacts are especially of concern for children exposed to BPA. The risks associated with BPA exposure have become common knowledge amongst consumers, which has created market and regulatory pressure to remove BPA from food packaging applications. As a result, many manufacturers have proactively removed BPA from their products. However, other bisphenols, such as bisphenol F or bisphenol F or bisphenol F or bisphenol S, <laughs> may be used as drop-in replacements for BPA in some applications. <coughs> These two bisphenols are both on the Canada chemical list and exhibit similar endocrine disrupting properties as BPA. Additionally, there are other non-bisphenol chemicals that may be used to manufacture cannon lid liners, such as glycidyl methacrylate, a Canada chemical that is a category 1B carcinogen and reproductive toxicant. Furthermore, DTSC is aware of the different types of can liners that, that can be used in food packaging applications, such as acrylic resins, plant-based resins, polyester resins, and vinyls. As such, we are interested in gathering information on the usage and specific chemical compositions of all of these products. To avoid regrettable substitutions, DTSC has decided to pursue a functional use approach initially in order to collect information on all canna chemicals that are used in the production of can and lid liners. At this time, we do not know the prevalence of BPA and its replacements in can and lid liners and need further engagement with our stakeholders in order to fill these data gaps. DTSC is requesting additional information from stakeholders regarding the current use of BPA and its alternatives in food packaging, the availability and safety of alternatives, as well as the specific types of liners that are actually being used in the different food packaging applications. So now I'd like to open the floor to any uh, clarifying questions, and I want to thank you for your engagement on this important topic. All right. Any online? Thank you. 
Okay, a quiet crowd today. Oh, wait, I think we have one in the audience. Question? Yeah, hi. Actually, this isn't a clarifying question. It's a clarifying comment. Um, something you said about how um, BPA is classified in Europe. Actually, the agency that's responsible for the classification is the European Chemicals Agency, not EFSA. EFSA will do the risk assessments and the surveys of the food, but the agency that's responsible is the agency that does the um, classifications for industrial chemicals. Yeah, so just in case that wasn't clear. Okay, well, first, um, I want to thank our presenters uh, for sharing um, this information today. I want to thank everyone who's come here today and everyone online. Um, I want to highlight that um, we've opened a comment period on the documents we've posted um, that goes through December 19th. So there's a month to comment on those uh, papers and to address the questions we put out. Also, please note there's contact information there for Dr. Leonetti and Dr. Bruscia, uh, and you can contact them directly if, if you have comments, questions, or concerns. Um, I think I want to just highlight that we've been pretty transparent about what we know and what we don't know. And so um, I just want to encourage people listening and here today to look at those questions and to give us input. Um, we can only make decisions based on the information that we have, and I think that that's in everyone's best interest to make sure that we have good information. So I encourage everyone to be responsive. And if you have other questions, please let us know. Um, I also want to highlight that um, we will be having another workshop in January on the 14th. January 14th on food packaging, including PFAS chemicals and their alternatives. Uh, it'll be a similar format, only um, we'll, we may have more speakers. We'll see by then. Um, but again, as we move through this process, it's really important that we get, inf get good information so we can uh, collect that and make good decisions moving forward. Andre, anything to add? Okay, well, with that, I thank you all for coming. I think you've... Oh, is that it? Well, is there, is there any more? Well, yeah, One last chance for comments or questions. Does Don't be shy. Do wish to make a comment? Raise your hand. I've got one. Can you, can you provide the microphone? And then online... Online, if you have any comments, please make sure you submit them now. We have one comment here uh, at the location. Yeah, I think I was just going to make one comment with respect to the question raised on cumulative risk. Um, I think it's important to be mindful that when you conduct cumulative risk, it's important that you're conducting it based on the fact that the individual chemicals have the same activity. I will point out when uh, CPSC did cumulative risk for, th for orthothalates, they were very careful to point out that certain orthothalates did not have the same um, hazard profiles, and so those chemicals were excluded from the cumulative risk. When the European Food Safety Authority did a cumulative risk for orthothalates, they were also very careful to make that distinction. Not all chemicals that had had the same, not all of the values had the same hazard profile, and so not all of them were actually lumped into the cumulative risk approach as well. So it's really important to kind of point out that small detail. Okay, and that was uh, Dr. Danuga uh, who spoke earlier. Can, can you uh, please list your name when you yeah. speak? That Thank you. It's Lisa Van Vliet, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. Um, that issue about... Um, additive effects between similarly acting chemicals and dissimilarly acting chemicals was actually thrashed through quite thoroughly in Europe during the endocrine disruption discussions in, around 2010 to 2012. And I think you'll find that the uh, leading researchers on endocrine disruption who don't restrict themselves to the um, good lab laboratory practice type work have actually um, quite clearly said that you have to take dissimilarly acting chemicals into account and that sticking to only similarly acting chemicals will not protect human health or the environment. So thank you, Lisette. Um, this is a good opportunity for me, me to make an important point about the Safer Consumer Products regulations and our approach. First of all, 
this is not a risk assessment driven process. We've laid out a framework that looks first at hazard and then does a look at exposure. So there's an element of risk, however you want to define it. But we have a narrative standard that says, is there um, evidence that there's potential for exposure to one or more of these chemicals in a product? And is there potential that it may cause or contribute to significant or widespread adverse impact? Once that threshold is reached and we list a priority product and regulation, we're not asking people to go do a risk assessment. We're not asking them to do a cumulative risk assessment. What we're asking them to do is go through our alternatives analysis process, which is to look at that priority product and compare it to potential alternatives through a broad spectrum of uh, endpoints and potential impacts throughout the life cycle of that product from the extraction of the minerals to the production of the product to its use to its ultimate uh, end of life. This is a very different framework than what we're used to in Europe or here in the U.S. in terms of traditional risk assessment. And risk assessment has its great aspects, cumulative and traditional, whatever. But... Um, it's just important to understand the regulatory framework that we are working in. It's not the same thing. We do look at cumulative risk, essentially. We do look at um, hazard. We do look at over the life cycle. But the question is, does this warrant us moving to the next phase of the process, which is alternative analysis? And so it's important that we, we don't get too far ahead of ourselves and assume that there's an outcome that might come out of an AA. Uh, our intent is that we get people who design these products and have the information to do a robust, scientifically sound process that looks at alternatives and see if there's a safer way to make their product, ultimately. Um, so that, that provides a, a broad landscape of potential outcomes. And I, th and I think it's important that we don't get ahead of ourselves and either bring something in inappropriately or limit ourselves because we think it doesn't meet some risk assessment kind of criteria. So with that little soapbox discussion about our regulations, which I often do, um, I invite any other comments or questions? Any online? Baku, anything online? Okay, a couple of things. Again, thank. I want to also um, do a shout out to Baku Her, our uh, staff person who, uh, along with some other great staff in our program, make these workshops actually happen. Uh, it is a fair amount of work, and we really appreciate that. I want to thank everyone who's participated today, and I'm thanking you in advance for your continued engagement, because this is a process that we need that engagement throughout the, um, uh, a series of uh, workshops and uh, dialogue. So with that, I will close this workshop, and uh, we'll see you in January, and we'll look forward to your comments. Workshop is now closed. <laughs>